Okay, everyone. It's good to see everybody. Um, welcome you all to our regular monthly talk story event. I'm Stan Liu. I'm uh, with the 1882 Foundation. I'm a program director here, uh, and we're located in Washington, D.C. We originated in 2012 here in Washington, D.C., Chinatown, and we've been doing our event every month since around 2012. And we normally done it live in person in Chinatown until the, the pandemic hit us in March of 2020. So uh, we've been mostly online since then, although this, this year we have started some hybrid presentations, and, um, but today we are strictly uh, virtual. So I'm glad you're here with us. And we wanna let you know that we are live streaming on Facebook and recording. So if those of you in the audience, if you're uncomfortable with being on screen, turn off your camera, use the chat box to communicate with us. The audience will be muted during the program and you will be allowed to be unmuted during the question and answer session and open discussion after the presentation. Now, our, like I said, the 1882 Foundation is dedicated to doing this program and we do it to, prom to pr promote, uncover, understand, and share our American stories. It's been a regular feature in our DC AAPI community since 2012. It's a gathering of our community, our friends, our allies to share stories of our lives, heritage, history, hopes and ambitions, trials and tribulations. But we found the strength of our community lies in the power of the stories we share with each other. We invite your partnership with us through your participation and support. Our website is 1882foundation.org and you can find out more about us there and how you can help support us in various ways, including donations. And uh, we have many partners, collaborators, and co-conspirators. You know, our, you know, among them are uh, OCA, which is, o, which is OCA, Asian Pacific American Advocates, CACA, Chinese American Citizens Alliance, the DC Chinatown Service Center located at the, at the Chinese Community Church in DC, and the Chinese American Museum in DC. Those are just a few of our partners, and we, again, welcome you to join in our partnership here. And today, we are pleased to present another meaningful event in our series. And it's from a group of students from our intern co cohort of inter summer interns. This has been an amazing cohort of students bringing new energy and ideas to our mission and activities. We're very proud of them, and six of them have been working all summer uh, on this event today, and uh, the team is, comp and they'll, they'll be introduced as they present themselves later, but they are Hongyan Zhao from Boston University, Elizabeth Berry from uh, George Mason University, Melanie Chu from uh, McLean Langley High School, little Emily Brignan, Brignan from American University, Vincent Zhang from Georgetown University, and Ian Kung from William and Mary University. Uh, their presentation is entitled Youth to Youth, Rewriting American History. It's, uh, and I won't go into the details of that. The details will be given to you by their by our Director of Education for 1882 Foundation, who uh, will, will be directing the program. And I just want a short introduction for Ting Yi. He's been our education director at 1882 Foundation, well-renowned scholar and, and um, educator in Virginia. And we we're very fortunate to have him on board with us and have a great respect for this man. You know, he teaches us a lot of things and, 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 he's, been, and he's led this team uh, this summer and, and so Tingy, uh, Tingy Ui, I'll let, I'll let you have the floor now and take over. 
Thank you very much, Stan. I appreciate those kind words. Uh, and, uh, you know, I have uh, really a very simple task to do here to introduce the interns um, who will then give their own introductions to their work. But it's really been my pleasure over the last uh, eight, 10 weeks or so uh, to work with them, discover what their interests are, something about their backgrounds and the interests they bring and their ideas to uh, the projects that you're going to see in just a few moments. Stan, you mentioned that uh, they bring new energy and new ideas. Uh, I really think that the uh, energy and ideas that you guys are gonna have a chance to witness here in the next few minutes um, will be very, very engaging. Um, one of the things um, that I appreciate so much about going through this process with interns is just how much I learned. And I know I can guarantee that all of you are going to learn something new. In fact, you're going to learn a lot of new things here, just as I did during the course of the summer here. So um, I'm really looking forward to this. Um, we hope, too, that these uh, lessons uh, that the interns are going to be speaking about will become part of what we figure is going to be really the uh, broader goal of how do we embed a lot of Asian American content into the curriculum. So this is really a, an important step for doing that. And the fact <clears throat> that we have this on Facebook, the fact that we have it added on YouTube, these will go uh, a long way towards reaching out towards people to making sure that our stories are indeed heard. That's really all I have to say here. I'm looking forward to hearing what the presentation is going to be. And I'm going to start with Hong Yang Zhao uh, and let him take it from here and introduce himself and his project. Thank you, Tingyi. And hello, everyone. Uh, my name is Hong Yang Zhao, and I'm a rising junior at Boston University. And so as an intern on the education team this summer, my, I'm mostly in the lesson planning business. So my project covers like a group of lesson plans that explore the reasons that why like uh, people left China in the 19th century. So um, without further ado, let's get right into it. Hello everyone, my name is Hong Yang Zhao and I'm an education intern at the 1882 Foundation this summer. And today I will be presenting on my project under the talk story, Youth to Youth Rewriting American History. Without further ado, let's get started. So my project is a series of lesson plans that focus on the reasons behind the Chinese exodus in the 19th century. And due to the limited time I had, I've only come up with three lesson plans so far and I put them here in chronological order. And the first is the Treaty of Nanking of 1842, followed by the Taiping Rebellion from 1850 to 1864. And lastly, we have the Chinese Educational Mission from 1872 to 1881. And the first, the Treaty of Nanking, it is the first unequal treaty signed by the Qing dynasty during the 19th century. And it was regarded as a, as a major source of Chinese grievances and discontent at the time, which caused a lot of Chinese people to either rebel or leave the country. And it has, you know, like several provisions that privileged the British over the Chinese because the Chinese lost to the British in the first Opium War. And for this lesson, I want the students to take a closer look at these individual articles and see how they could impact the lives of ordinary Chinese citizens. And, uh, and also we will be looking at textual resource, uh, sources on the reactions to the treaty, either in forms of violent confrontation or public condemnation. And we will also analyze a painting that depicts the signing of the uh, Treaty of Nanking, you know, to see how the Brit how the Chinese and the British uh, responded to to it, and um, based on you know their facial expressions and the number of people in the cabinet, and um, yeah, so that's it for the Treaty of Nanking, and uh, moving on, we have the Taiping Rebellion which is regarded as, you know, one of the bloodiest and the greatest conflict during that time. And it was also, you know, recognized as like a major driver be behind the Chinese emigration from China because of, you know, you know, the agony and wartime struggle. So 
first we will be you know doing like sort of like a comparison between the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom and the Qing Dynasty to see why the Taiping rebellions could gain popular support at the beginning you know and um, we will also be looking to the personal story of Hong Xiuquan the, the leader of the rebellion and his you know in terms of his rise to power and religion, you know, like the typing version of Christianity. And uh, we'll be looking at textual sources at the time, you know, on, uh, for example, the uh, typing version of Bible and uh, like the, and its religious teachings. And uh, we will, uh, by looking at these documents, the students can see how this, you know, uh, typing values and religious teachings were impacting the lives of Hong Xiuquan subjects within the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom. And lastly, we will be, you know, as a part of the, uh, like the uh, overall discussion about, you know, Chinese immigration at the time, we'll be uh, looking at the reasons why people were leaving the Taiping Heavenly Kingdom, like what were they doing uh, in that country that like, kind of push people to leave. And uh, we will be, you know, uh, taking an like analytical look at the reasons behind. And then, last but not the least, we have the Chinese educational mission, which I will be spending most time talking about. So first, it's important for te the teacher to provide like sort of background information about this mission, and uh, it all starts. It all started with the, you know, the self-strengthening movement that took place in the 1970s, where like a group of reform-minded Chinese officials wanted to save China through Western technology and ideas. And you know, in, uh, to this end, they want they they wanted to, like the the, uh, the the younger generation to uh, to go to the United States and to acquire this advanced and progressive progressive beliefs so that when they return to China, they could help the modernization and eventually the salvation of China. So it's it's, it's important to, to, to know like why this official sent the students to the United States in the first place. And then we will be focusing on the experience of these Chinese uh, students in the United States, you know, either by you know looking at their autobiography, memoirs, and some other secondary sources, and we will be you know uh, doing close readings with you know some of the excerpts and uh, to see like uh, to get a nuance of uh, their experience in the United States, and we will also be looking at several photos that you know for example like a photo of the first Chinese students who were sent to the United States right like we wanted to know like like the the background of these students, like uh, their age, their gender, and uh, their family background, you know, and to see, like, uh, to kind of draw parallels between, you know, what was happening back then and the, you know, and the students' own experiences. And uh, of course, lastly, we will be talking about some of the prominent students, you know, from this mission and their accomplishments and you know contributions to to China and um, yeah so and this is not it uh, because you know I want just want to talk about like the founder of the Chinese educational mission Yun Wing who was dubbed as the father of Chinese international students because he was the first Chinese student to graduate from a US college namely Yale and uh, and uh, he uh, had this, you know, educational vision on, you know, the salvation of China through uh, Western ideas. And that's why he proposed to, you know, he kind of work with other officials who wanted to do the same thing to, you know, establish the Chinese educational mission. And he was the supervisor of it until its cancellation in uh, the 1980s. And uh, he was really a pro prominent figure in, you know, modern China because like he was part of, you know, like the uh, most of the reforms and the revolutions in China, including the revolution of 1911 when, you know, the Qing dynasty was officially ended by the Republic of China. So 
I thought like uh, he he uh, his personal story is something worth looking at um, because he delineated his um, uh, educational philosophy and the reasons behind the establishment of the Chinese educational mission and its eventual downfall. So yeah, he's definitely something that people sh should be looking into, uh, should be uh, looking into, and. Um, as you know, even because like he's not like generally like a part of the standard curriculum. So uh, why did I uh, do lesson plans on these topics? So first I would say like, uh, like most of the current uh, standards or curriculum focus on like the experiences of Chinese Americans after they have arrived in the United States, right? Like their accomplishments, their, uh, their struggles, right? But not too many lessons talk about like why they came in the first place. So that's why I wanted to kind of delve into this understudied subject, like how, like why did these Chinese people want to leave China? And what pushed them to leave their home? And um, and it's it was a really rewarding experience for me as well because I, Got to learn about the Chinese educational mission, which I knew nothing about before this project, and um, I thought it was really interesting because, as a Chinese international student myself, I felt most of their experiences relate relatable to mine. Not all of it, because you know I'm not here to you know study for the salvation of my country, but still, it's like this you know uh, like their patriotic aspiration as well as their you know, like determination to uh, to see a better China, kind of that's something I can resonate with. And um, so, yeah, that's why I decided to kind of do this lesson plans on them so that people can become more informed about their experiences and um, like uh, the implications of their experiences on uh, like the current uh, situation. So, that's about it. And um, if you want to, if you have any questions or just want to stay in touch with me, you can reach me at the email address here. I uh, thank you again for your attention and have a good day. All right, so um, that's it for my uh, presentation. And now I will pass it to Elizabeth. Thanks, Yang. Hi, everyone. So um, I'm Elizabeth. Um, for my project at the 1882 Foundations Education Program, um, Mr. Tingyi thought it would be best for me to work on adapting some of the lesson plans into elementary school lesson plans because I've had um, work with elementary school students in the past. And so I have created different lesson plans for kids. And so you guys will learn more about it in the video. I don't want to spoil. But, um, but yeah, so I've created lesson plans for kids and um, I hope you guys enjoy. Hello everyone, my name is Elizabeth Berry and I am a senior at George Mason University, double majoring in Global Affairs and Chinese Mandarin. Today I'm going to be sharing with you my journey as an 1882 Foundation intern working in the education program. Let's begin. Putting the facts back. So how did this all start? Well, for one, I was tasked with adapting some of the lesson plans currently in the 1882 Foundation archives for use with elementary school students. Out of all the lesson plans that I went through, I chose four. Patsy Mink, Queen Lilio Cavani, Corky Lee, and the Transcontinental Railroad. I also created an additional lesson plan that focused on Peking Opera Mask, which was inspired by a project that I did for the Chinese Cultural Center at my university. I rewrote each lesson plan and added activities and media that could be enjoyed by elementary school children. I enjoyed working on each of the lesson plans, but found that I was most inspired by the history of Corky Lee. For those of you who may not know, Corky Lee was a photographer and activist who spent his life using photographs to preserve the history of and advocate for the Asian American community. 
So to do all of this, I read through the archive lessons and thought of ways to simplify the information without losing valuable information. I changed the language that was used to introduce the individuals in the history lessons. I created vocabulary lists for the concepts that were central to the lesson plans but required explanation for younger students. I restated or created objectives for the lessons. For example, why is the lesson important and what each student should gain from it. I researched and provided hyperlinks for videos and pictures that would further cement the importance of the lesson. Finally, and my favorite part, I developed crafts or worksheets that would help to reinforce the central ideas of each person and their importance in American history and the Asian American community in particular. So for Patsy Mink, we have the advocacy pamphlet. For Queen Lily Okalani, we have a feather cape. For Peking Opera Mask, we have Peking Opera Mask coloring sheets. And for Corky Lee, we have Polaroid and Camera Project. Now, when working on these lesson plans, I did find some challenges. And the biggest challenge was finding resources to include in the lesson plans so that teachers can have access to as much information as possible. For example, when working on the Transcontinental Railroad History Plan, there were resources, video, there were no readily available video resources for kids that discuss the contributions of Asian Americans. This demonstrated to me the needs for literature, movies, et cetera, that focus on the history of Asian Americans. I was also worried that I would not do an effective job presenting the lives of these amazing people and the significance of their contributions to the world. I hope that the final products that I create Capture the, capture the lives and purposes of Patsy Mink, Queen Lily Okolani, Corky Lee, and the importance of Asian Americans in the development of the Transcontinental Railroad. I think that the crafts and media will help students connect with a part of American history that they had not previously thought of. I also like the idea that the assigned craft projects are relatively simple and do not require teachers or parents to purchase expensive or wear items to complete them. Furthermore, many of the activities encourage children to think about the lives of others and the importance of advocating for causes that are important to them. Overall, I wish that there were more resources available to help with the creation of the lesson plans. I spent a lot of time searching for information regarding the historic Americans or events in the lesson plans with little reward for my efforts. However, I truly believe that the 1882 education program can be an answer to this problem. I would like to see the 1882 education program be widely more used. I would like for the name the 1882 education program to be as well known and widely utilized as McGraw Hill or Pearson. I would love to see the archives to become used by school systems throughout the United States as a reliable resource. I would also like to see them utilized by a community that I love dearly, homeschoolers. Growing up, I was homeschooled. My mom would work diligently to find lesson plans to ensure that we had a well-rounded education. If the resources were not there or did not meet our standards, she would create lesson plans for me and my siblings. I think these lesson plans would benefit the homeschool community and would also meet the standards of parents who want to broaden their children's horizons. Putting the facts back, which is the title of this presentation, is really just putting back Asian American contributions back into American history. Asian American history is American history and must be included in our children's education so that they can see how valuable we all are to the past, present, and future of this country and of the world. Thank you. Thanks, you guys. Um, so yeah, that was my um, presentation. And so I will pass it on to Melanie. All right, thanks, Elizabeth. Um, my name is Melanie Chu, and I'm an incoming first year at the University of Virginia who grew up in the Northern Virginia area. Um, this summer, I've been uncovering little known Virginia API narratives and creating lesson plans based on my findings. Um, so my presentation showcases my lesson plan development process by focusing on one of my favorite lesson plans. So please enjoy. Hi, my name is Melanie Chu and I am an incoming first year at the University of Virginia who has had the amazing opportunity to intern with the 1882 Foundation this summer. My work with the 1882 Foundation actually stems beyond the summer um, from this past 2021 to 2022 school year for my 12th grade U.S. government project. 
I advocated for API inclusion in Virginia high school history classes, speaking with API interest groups and organizations such as the 1882 Foundation, and with legislators ranging from Fairfax County School Board members to Virginia State Senators and Curriculum Development Specialists from the Virginia Department of Education. As a Virginia resident who had grown up through the Virginia and Fairfax County school systems, I had seen a lack of API individuals represented in my history classes. I had wished that I had learned more about remarkable API figures like Patsy Mink rather than about this generalized group that seemed to pop out of nowhere in my textbook's timelines. Additionally, I wanted to find more local Virginia API narratives that would prove that API history has just as much of a um, place in Virginia classrooms as any of the other lessons in today's U.S. history curriculum. During my research, I uncovered the life stories of myriad spectacular API individuals, including Kim Kyu Sheik, a Korean student who studied at Roanoke College before representing his entire country at the Paris Peace Conference concluding World War I, and Pearl Fu, a Chinese-American woman who um, established the local Colors Festival in Roanoke, a diverse multicultural platform for thousands to share their cultural traditions. I learned that um, Asian Americans have fought to find their place in America as war heroes dating all the way back to the Civil War, outspoken politicians serving in all levels of government, and passionate citizens who expressed their identities as Asian Americans through a variety of media. As I created lesson plans about API in Virginia, I found Marie Kyogoku Hasegawa's story to be especially captivating. Hasegawa was a Japanese-American activist who grew up in the wake of Executive Order 9066, helped to organize the 1963 March on Washington, and visited North Vietnam during the Vietnam War as president of the U.S. chapter of Women's International League for Peace and Freedom, also known as WILF. As not just a bystander who lived through major events of the 20th century, but as an active leader who engaged with international, national, and local community issues alike, Hasegawa proved to be the perfect overview of 20th century U.S. history for middle school students who need both a fresh take on some events they have heard of before and an introduction to new topics. Furthermore, Hasegawa has an inspiring philosophy of patriotism through activism that is fundamental for those um, middle school students who are beginning to understand themselves as members of, of a community rather than as simple individuals. In 2012, Janice Gagnelli, Linda Fleet Perry, and Pat Tashian premiered their documentary on Hasegawa titled Marie's Hasegawa, Gentlewoman of a, of a Dangerous Kind, um, starring Hasegawa's own narration and commentary on her life. I noticed that the film covered several major events during the 20th century in which Hasegawa was directly involved. The Japanese-American incarceration during World War II, um, the Civil Rights Movement, the Red Scare, and the Vietnam War in terms of the protests conducted on the home front and the U.S. involvement abroad. The film also mentioned um, Hasegawa's involvement in the local community of Richmond as an activist. I wanted students not only to learn about Hasegawa's impact on history, but also to remember the historical milestones and vocabulary mentioned in the film through an active portion of the lesson. At first, I thought about creating a video notes worksheet for them to fill out while watching the documentary like I had often had in my classes, but I didn't think that it was engaging enough or would help students to remember Hasegawa. However, I thought that including a second activity after the half hour documentary may cause teachers to feel constrained by time, especially if their class periods are on the shorter side. But I ultimately decided on creating a lesson plan based on the latter, including the 30 minute documentary with this 90 minute max lesson plan. Because having that big picture introduction to 20th century American history for these middle schoolers who may be learning about these events for the first time is so important. After the documentary, I decided to allow students to take charge of their own learning and research one of the five major events listed before um, or on Hasegawa's Richmond advocacy and connect the topic to the documentary. The Hasegawa documentary used many historical vocab words like Pearl Harbor and the March on Washington, so I wanted the students to supplement their research with these new terms. I also wanted to include a few new terms not mentioned in the film so that students can gain a more comprehensive overview of the research topic. For example, for the Red Scare group, I listed McCarthyism as a vocab word from the documentary because during the age of McCarthyism, Wilf was accused of being a communist organization, um, threatening Hasegawa's residency as she was not yet a U.S. citizen. 
In order to reveal uh, the intensity of theoretic consequences during the Red Scare, I listed a couple extra vocab words for the, research, for the group to research. Um, the House Un-American Activities Committee that um, investigated and tried citizens accused of communist activity, and President Truman's loyalty order that allowed the FBI to investigate over 3 million federal employees accused of communist activity. To conclude the lesson, I thought about what I wanted the students to take away from this lesson and how they can apply it to their everyday lives. I wanted to emphasize Hasegawa as the focus of this lesson and to have time for students to connect Hasegawa's philosophy to their own lives. So I provided two reflection questions. I really like this Hasegawa quote. I feel a national loyalty to the US. I feel part of that loyalty is protesting when it does wrong because I feel like it encompasses Hasegawa's mission and an important civic outlook on life. For the first question, I asked that students reflect upon this quote and connect it to Hasegawa's community work. For the second, I asked that students brainstorm an aspect of their community that they would want to change or improve and how they can help as Hasegawa did in her community. I really enjoyed creating this lesson plan because I had the opportunity to become an expert on a part of history that I had never heard of in history class. I think that using Hasegawa's life and the Hasegawa documentary as an introduction to 20th century American history is a captivating and refreshing new take and a clever way to incorporate um, AAPI history into existing curriculum requirements. As teachers use lesson plans like mine that um, involve more powerful API representation, I hope they consider how they can bring in the names of specific figures, um, utilized primary sources and original API voices, and incorporate representation into their existing lesson plans. I learned about the last of these from the 1882 Foundation itself, and I think this seemingly simple solution will allow teachers to make a great impact upon their students' education. I have really enjoyed researching API in Virginia, creating lesson plans, and working with my fellow interns and staff at the 1882 Foundation this summer. I hope that the education program continues to expand and advocate for Asian American history in schools in the greater Washington area and nationwide. Thank you. Thank you all for watching. Um, now I'd like to pass it on to Emily. Thank you, Melanie. Hi, everyone. I hope your day is going well so far. So my education project was creating a toolkit uh, to increase political engagement among API youth. As the midterm elections are getting closer, I figured I could provide tools and ways to motivate the younger generation of Asian Americans to be more politically active. I'll be exercising this toolkit this fall when I return to campus and activate voter registration drives for the elections. For more details uh, and a brief look into the type of narrative I would use uh, to encourage my fellow Asian Americans, we will now play a recorded video of me explaining more about the inspiration, purpose, and goals of this project. Thank you. Hi everyone, my name is Emily Brignand. I'm originally from Reno, Nevada and a current rising junior studying international studies and music at American University in DC. The reason why I joined the 1882 Foundation was due to my interest in learning the Chinese American or more broadly speaking, the Asian American experience in the United States. I want to find ways to advocate for and uplift these communities I want to become more knowledgeable of DC Chinatown due to my passion, my research project and the development of DC Chinatown. And last but not least, the core reason why I joined the education curriculum team was to find ways in expanding the minimal political power API communities hold. This led to my contribution to the education team where I wanted to not only educate on the importance of voting and political engagement, but also bring forth ideas our history into action as a motivation and making it into tangible steps that the youth can take and do to build upon their motivation and passion to truly represent and uplift our communities. I'm in the middle of building a toolkit that educators and activists can use to inspire API communities, specifically the youth, to feel motivated in participating in the political system especially during a time that is so dark and pessimistic when looking at the current political climate and regression in social movements. It's easy to resort to questions such as, does voting even matter? Does my one vote even count? 
uh, when the changes we're witnessing aren't what we had hoped for. However, that attitude not only tears down the decades of progress we have made, but it also discourages any positive change and movements that counter the negative and backward ones. Plus, before I move on to my next point, it is statistically insufficient to think that your vote doesn't matter because the more votes there are, the more split or divided the voting pie is. So by giving up your vote, you're actually not only not part of the political conversation and decision making process, but you're also giving more power to the people who are voting. While voting is extremely important, it is also crucial to recognize that not everyone has the ability or the privilege to vote. It is known that marginalized groups in America have not always had the political power they have today. In fact, Asian Americans have not only been excluded from the political world for more than a century, but they also encountered and experienced little exclusion, specifically Chinese immigrants from even entering this country for more than half a century. Comparing that, a time when we were completely invisible in the political world to the current stage where we are able to exercise our right to vote, though we are still very underrepresented in Congress, having 6.1% of AAPI members uh, being, the, being in the US population, but only making up 0.9% of elected officials. We have actually made a significant amount of progress that we do not recognize enough. In fact, during the 2020 elections, we Asian Americans truly showed that our voice can no longer be silenced or ignored from having a record voter turnout across the nation. It is predicted that Asian Americans will steadily grow into a dominant force in American politics and that we are the new wave of undecided voters that politicians will pay more attention to. Now more than ever do we have to unite and fight for our communities in order to be seen and heard. As we witness from the Stop Asian Hate Movement, the model minority concept or myth actually is being deconstructed. We are finally at more of a consensus that being the invisible minority will not serve us well and will actually be harmful to us in the long run and to other communities. On top of historic structural exclusion we're facing, there's also the cultural and generational barriers that prevent us from being more involved than we would like to be. Another aspect to consider is the challenge of the diversity uh, within the Asian American community. Since we are so diverse in the different nationalities, ethnicities, and the languages we speak, we are both overrepresented and underrepresented. For example, nationally, Asian Americans are more likely than Americans overall to be without a high school diploma, but they are also more likely to have a four-year college degree. So depending on the scale in which we're measuring certain qualities, being in an inherently large category puts us in a tricky spot that naturally pits us against each other due to that large difference among different groups within the community. So recognizing our similarities and differences is incredibly crucial because our internal diversity is very important to us and is so beautiful. However, we need to channel that using that diversity that we possess uh, to bring us together, actually the pan Asian groups as it is the best path to political power because if we keep following the current system that is designed to pit minority groups against one another, then the people in power will continue to stay in power without any consideration of including us. The goal is to broaden the pie so that we can all get more pieces of it. Therefore, my goal through my project is to provide and bring forth a toolkit that allows more AAPI members, particularly the younger generation, to be more raised, provided for, influenced to participate in the civic process organize and mobilize the community. In preparation for the midterm elections this fall, I am gathering, creating that toolkit that I wish I had when I was a younger voter in the year 2020. I hope to create more hope and optimism in the trajectory of having more Asian American political empowerment through direct engagement in the process. This toolkit consists of historical lessons and facts that I briefly mentioned uh, just now that 
show how far we have come that would motivate people and give a different perspective on why voting matters. I want to provide ways to become more engaged and it doesn't even have to be big where you run for uh, a position in office, but just registering to vote, voting, or participating in grassroots movements and organizations. And last but not least, having more difficult conversations with family members to encourage them to be more active in the political process as well. This project will be more finalized when it gets closer to the voter registration period, and hopefully this will, this will make a difference. Um, I truly hope this can encourage and empower Asian Americans to participate in the political process. Thank you guys for tuning in and remember to vote this fall. I will now pass the mic to Vincent. Thank you so much for that wonderful presentation, Emily. Um, but I guess it's on to me now. So hello, my name is Vincent Zhang and I'm a rising junior at Georgetown University. This summer, as part of the 1882 education team, I transcribed several pre-existing lessons, um, but more importantly, I developed a series of lesson plans centered around an aspect of Asian American history that I don't believe is well known enough. And that is the civil resistance movement against the internment of Japanese Americans, rather the incarceration of Japanese Americans in relocation camps. Um, I think that most people are well aware of the existence of Japanese American incarceration as you know, something that has happened, uh, but are probably not knowledgeable about key figures like Frank Seishi Emi or Mike Masaoka. I will spoil the contents of my presentation, so let's just get started with the video. Hello, everyone. Uh, so this is my uh, sort of part that I'm going to be talking about right now. Um, and I want to share with you all my 1882 education team experience, um, or in other words, what I've learned from lessons in Japanese American incarceration. So first, a brief overview of just, you know, the work I've done for the education team this summer. I had the pleasure of creating three lesson plans, all pretty interconnected. They're all related to the incarceration of Japanese Americans, um, specifically I uh, produced a lesson plan on Frank Emmy and the, uh, the Hart Mountain Fair Play Committee. I produced a second lesson plan on James Amura and uh, the Rocky Shinpo newspaper. And finally, uh, I produced a third lesson on the Japanese American Citizens League. Uh, and you can see on the, on the right, I have all three of my uh, lesson plans pictured. Uh, I just took uh, screenshots of the headers to give like a brief idea of um, what the content consists of. Uh, each of my lesson plans follows a pretty similar format. Um, it first has this like background introduction section, just uh, sort of explaining who this person was or what this organization was, and I guess sort of chronology of the history uh, that is uh, attached to them. Um, and then for the actual activity portions, I uh, collated a bunch of excerpts from writings they've done, either like textual examples, um, so, for example, uh, for the Japanese American Citizens League lesson, I uh, I put a speech um, that was made by one of the executive uh, leaders of the organization back in the 40s, um, and then related to that, sort of following the 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 textual uh, sample, I would then uh, pose what I consider some thought provoking questions that um, are designed to get the students to really think about. Um, what this particular document or speech uh, belies about um, what this person organization is like uh, holds to be like a, a steadfast value, um, trying to sort of explore general societal trends of the time, um, those kinds of questions like that uh, I, I hope are engaging and also uh, informative or rather uh, like I put, thought provoking. Um, so just to give you a better idea of what exactly is in each of my lessons, uh, I have attached an example activity here. So, uh, and I've also put a diagram on the side to sort of explain what each part of this is. So first I have this um, you know, fancy schmancy title, a case study of pathos and publications. By the way, this is the third activity for my um, James O'Mora lesson. Um, 
for background, James Omora was the English language editor for Rocky Simpo. Um, so I had a abundance of uh, rec records and um, samples of text that I could use for this. And so I chose to use um, uh, this editorial from his newspaper. Uh, I have a brief explainer, kind of contextualizing what it is. Uh, I obviously attached the excerpt itself. And then I have some questions on the bottom. Um, and so I, I hope I don't really need to read all of them out loud. But, you know, question number two, for example, like, what do you notice about the wording in this excerpt compared to previous ones from three years prior? Those are previous activities. Do you think this change of tone is warranted and or compelling? Um, so these are the type of questions that I think uh, the, the, the style of questions that um that I, I like to ask are kind of like complimentary. So first I have like a sort of basic one, like what do you notice about the wording? Oh, it might be that um, it's very impassioned. It's very uh, accusatory against um, the current presidential administration. And then do you think this change of tone is warranted and compelling? Um, and then, you know, the student would then have to decide that for themselves. And it can really teach them about how, uh, for this specific lesson, the, the sort of like, tenets of editorial journalism. Um, yeah. So uh, you might be asking, you might be wondering, where do they get the inspiration to make these lessons that focus so, uh, I guess, squarely on this specific chapter of history? Well, um, it's pretty straightforward. Uh, last semester, um, so I'm a rising junior right now, last semester, my sophomore spring, I had the pleasure of taking this class called Intro to Asian American Studies. Um, it's a very unassuming name, but it was genuinely one of the best classes I've ever taken. And for a week, uh, we focused on this area of history. We read um, this collection of diaries and uh, diary entries and essays from uh, various uh, uh, incarcerated Japanese Americans who uh, wrote down their experiences at the camps. And we also watched this documentary called uh, Conscience and the Constitution. And this was a very, uh, I would say, impactful documentary for me. It really painted this whole narrative that I had no idea existed at all. It was some, uh, it was, a, as the title suggests, Conscience in the Constitution. It was, it was the sort of like constitutional legal litigation aspect of this whole um, uh, period of Japanese American incarceration. Um, you can see Frank Emmy is pictured on the front. He features prominently as well as James Amora and of course the Japanese American Citizens League. Um, and I think what was so uh, compelling about this documentary was that the real, the sort of quote unquote real history of the camps was so much more complicated. Um, I think before watching it, I just assumed that Japanese Americans kind of um, acquiesced to the, the, the orders um, to relocate, um, but I wasn't at all aware that there was this uh, sort of civil resistance movement. And that's kind of what this documentary is about. And so I thought it would be a great uh, basis off of which to teach um, uh, sort of ideas of like civic advocacy, um, civil rights, that um, like things I think that are important for students in like government classes to learn about. So I'm gonna talk briefly about the process of actually making one of my lessons. Um, so first and foremost, you got to read up on the history. Uh, I have three sources listed here. Densho Encyclopedia is uh, probably the most uh, useful and well-known of the, the sources you could use for any sort of education on Japanese American incarceration. It's an encyclopedia dedicated to chronicling all of the various uh, things you would want to know. So they have a, they have a page on the Heart Mountain Fair Play Committee, um, which I, absolutely cited for my Frank Emmy lesson. Um, and then I would sort of jot down any takeaways I had on the notes app. And then I would back, uh, cut, like back form questions from those notes. Um, I like to think that my questions were pretty similar to those that I, to the sort of discussions that I had in my introduction to studies class, um, which I mean to be like, I hope they were thought provoking because I thought that class was incredibly thought provoking. And of course, I'd organize my ideas into activities. Um, 
uh, I will say the most, I guess, the toughest part of this whole process was scouring the Library of Congress website for specific Rocky Shimpo newspaper clippings. Um, and that took quite a while. There was no easy way to sort of uh, pinpoint any one piece of editorial content that I wanted. I had to kind of go issue by issue. Um, I guess I was fortunate enough that the Library of Congress had uh, sort of um, digitized all of these uh, issues, but it was a pretty tedious process. And condensing information, trying to choose which uh, key takeaways I wanted students to learn was also pretty tough. Um, so student takeaways, what about my takeaways? Like, what did I learn from this whole process? Um, all in all, I think it was pretty, it, it was tough, but it was very rewarding. I really got um, a sense of like appreciation for the work that teachers put in to um, making sure that students can not only learn about uh, the things that, you know, they should be learning about, but also in a manner that allows them to kind of stick in their heads, kind of um, like stick with me, stick with them as the, the, as I stuck with me after my intro to American studies class. Um, reflecting on this a bit more, I think for some areas of improvement, uh, I should have recognized that this sort of chapter of history needs a lot more than three lessons. Like there was the whole post-war redress movement, um, trying to get monetary compensation for uh, still living uh, former internees of the camps. Um, there's also the Heart Mountain Sentinel, that was a newspaper uh, at one of the camps. Um, and so there's a lot of information that it didn't end up using as material for lessons that I think given enough time and enough uh, sort of, like, uh, yeah, actually just given enough time, I could have definitely developed into more lessons. And I also uh, recognize that I uniquely kind of focused on this one area of history where I could have uh, branched out to any one any one of the various aspects of Asian American history that um, my colleagues and my fellow interns have uh, talked about. Um, but, you know, all in all, I thought it was a wonderful experience. It really, you know, gave me greater insight into how this whole educational process works. And on this slide, you may be wondering who are these pictures. Uh, the top picture, that is um, of Mr. Bradford Pearson. He's an author uh, who wrote a book, The Equals of Heart Mountain. Uh, it's about the experiences of the uh, incarcerated Japanese Americans at that camp. And I thought, you know, fitting way to sort of put this on the last slide. And then on the bottom, that's a picture of Mr. Franklin Odo, uh, who is um, a Japanese American um, activist. He uh, has done a lot of work with 1882. And um, actually, he uh, has been a great help to me. I, I personally uh, sort of talked with him about sort of like refining the lessons. And so uh, this presentation and the lessons, of course, could not have um, come about as a result of, if, if not, if he hadn't uh, offered his help. And yeah, so it's my presentation. You guys enjoy. Okay, and now on to our final speaker for the presentation portion, Ian. All right, thank you, Vincent, great presentation. Hi everyone, my name is Ian Kang, a rising sophomore at William & Mary. I plan on majoring in a degree that integrates math, economics, and computer science. Um, because of this, I don't get the opportunity to do much real work about the state of Asian American culture in our society today. So working on the education team this summer has been a fantastic experience. I never will learn so much about uh, ongoing education initiatives or gotten to see the amount of passion that people like me have for various issues. Um, but in my case, uh, my project was not centered around lesson plans, but uh, rather planning for a adult education workshop based on recommendations from a past Chinese school teacher. I believe it also has a place under the education initiative. So uh, thank you all for coming. And to close this out, this is my recounting of the project I did here this summer. Before the internship even started, the project that caught my eye was the Education and Curriculum Initiative because I immediately knew a way I could contribute. Rather than developing lesson plans on specific historical topics or events, my mind went to the best figure I had contact with that could speak on the intersection of educating and Asian Americans. This was my most recent Chinese school teacher, who was the person I thought of not only because of his experience, 
but also because of how he taught his classes with such ease and enthusiasm. I asked him several questions about what he thought about the current issues with regards to Asian American history and current education systems. I was hoping he might elaborate on what administrations could do to work towards a higher degree of inclusiveness, along with his experience as an educator, but I got a lot more than I was expecting. After the call, it seemed like the best way to make use of this information would be to apply towards an adult development workshop. The mission of such a workshop would be to give participants a better idea of how to conduct themselves in life or in the classroom so as to lead to higher levels of cultural inclusion. The intended audience for such a workshop would be either adults interested in learning about the position of Asian Americans today or current educators who would benefit from knowing how to approach Asian studies and lesson plans themselves. For the average person interested in learning about the position of Asian Americans, the workshop would at least give them something to think about and be aware of. All this while keeping in mind that the long-term goal beyond individual workshops and lesson plans is to instill a degree of understanding in upcoming generations so that the current issues we face can be gradually lessened. With that background knowledge from someone who has already seen success in fostering such understanding, people would simply continue not to take action or perpetuate failing to truly see another culture. As for the actual content of the workshop, I would like to summarize the insights I gathered. There's lots to mention, but two themes stand out as uh, the ones to focus on the most. First, it is Asian Americans' responsibility to show their other ethnic peers that they are not foreigners and have something to offer as good, honest people as well. Since historical and present-day animosity stems from U.S.-China relations, Asian Americans are opening themselves up to attack if they remain silent and isolated. As has been found in research on stereotyping Asians, higher concentrations of Asian Americans in certain areas such as California, New York, and Hawaii lead to some having less direct contact with Asians. This leads to less interactions, which means less relationships, and ultimately their perceptions are more likely to be cultivated by the media. This is all the more reason that Asians should be frequently active and friendly in their communities to show mutual care towards neighbors and the environment. After some trust and rapport has been established, they can begin the sharing of thousands of years of rich culture and history. This is all without a political agenda or ulterior motive, but simply to work through recreation centers and areas to gather uh, for its own benefits. Second, we need to make sure that the chosen topics are acceptable to both the East and West, otherwise it will lead to even more of the perception of being foreign. For all the beauty and cultural significance of our works and stories, just promoting pieces of cultural heritage is not meaningful. For a cultural education to be influential, we have to find common ground and match American values. For it to be effective, all you need to start is to make a positive experience out of it. On the community level, this could be as easy as having Chinese New Year pastries so that people will have more awareness and preferences when it comes to a large part of the culture. The education has to be complete, not partial, meaning we should cover the nuances as well. Uh, for example, Dragon Boat Festival, Sticky Rice Buns, and Moon Festival. In schools, it's not as common to see Asian culture taught beyond just the languages. On the part of the teachers, they also have to be aware of what will be easily accepted by Americans. We can start with more progressive private or bilingual schools that have such cultural class offerings already. Beyond these two main themes, there's also the possibility of going to other topics, such as the dissipation of Asian culture over time with each consecutive generation, and the reality that there are currently many gender and race issues also being addressed. So at the moment, it's quite hard to place as much emphasis on spreading understanding uh, between different cultures as much as we should. Using all of these insights, we could build about a half day workshop session going into examples of each theme and instances where they are both properly and improperly executed. The participants would be open to any person uh, interested in learning about the current state of Asian American affairs, including educators who would also benefit from it. We could start with something of a lecture so that the context is laid for the relevance of the content. Um, we would also be sure to incorporate interactive aspects such as discussion or putting the practices being taught into action. For example, giving all present a bag of Asian snacks that they could try if they would like. So the workshop itself would be a way to try to find some common ground and lessen the feeling of otherness that some might feel towards Asians. Like my teacher also mentioned, it's not easy to foster mutual understanding but the methods don't have to be complicated. It would just take some time and focusing on the right things. Thank you.
I want to thank you, Ian, and everybody else uh, for the uh, excellent presentations here. Really appreciate that. Um, while we uh, move on to uh, some questions uh, that you in the audience might have, I, I'm going to ask that you uh, put those into the chat. We'll try to monitor that. And if you have questions either for the, the whole group or for individuals, that'd be super. Um, in the, in the meantime, while you're maybe thinking through that, I have a, a couple of uh, observations here that I would just like to maybe have the uh, interns address uh, individually. Um, one is um, that one aspect of what we're talking about has to do a lot with personal stories, how to make the uh, history come alive through a lot of the work that's being done through uh, personal stories. And I'd like for each of you to see um, and address really the question of why you think that's important. What makes that different from perhaps the things you have learned in general before or in the way that we would re really like to see uh, things incorporated into what teachers really use in the classroom, kind of speaking maybe to Ian's point, how do we get them to uh, be prepared to really speak about these things? Maybe I, I think uh, probably best to address uh, one of the interns here first. Since we started with you, Hong Yang, you have some personal stories within the uh, collection of things about the, um, the uh, Chinese missions that were coming here. Um, why is that helpful? Yeah, so, um, so I guess for me, it's something, you know, I'm a, I'm a Chinese international student here in the United States, right? And I kind of wanted to kind of go back to see like when did all this start, right? And um, so I was looking back and yeah, I, and I think, um, you know, like I, 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 and I knew, and I learned that, you know, the, the reasons why they came to the United States in the first place was that they wanted to save their country, right? Like there was a whole, like a bigger, like a part of the bigger, movement that was taking place in China, where people were trying to uh, kind of uh, save China by introducing Western ideas and technologies uh, into the country. So, but for like, for me personally, I felt like, you know, it's something that, you know, uh, not only Chinese students should learn about, but like maybe, like maybe something that people, people within the Asian uh, American community should uh, take a closer look at because, uh, because you know, this, um, this Chinese people, students, like they came over and uh, they adopted uh, Western ideas and even, you know, like some, you know, practices and they came into conflict with the Chinese officials who started this mission, right? Because the, the Chinese officials were worried that they were adopting Western habits, so that without consideration for their Chinese background, and um, so I felt like you know that's that's a topic that we um, rarely address, you know, in like a standard curriculum or you know everyday learning, and um, because I felt like uh, even though like they came here with really good intentions, they still were somehow restricted, you know, by the Chinese authority as well as you know like the their cultural background in, in a sense. So I, I think, you know, it's something for me, you know, because I was also on the talk story, uh, the other talk story event, and I was, I've been exploring like how my cultural background has impacted my educational experience in the United States. So I feel, you know, there's like some parallels that could draw between my own experience and the experience of the Chinese international students that came like hundred years before I did. So, yeah, I think that's, you know, like a really rewarding uh, topic for me. And I feel like I even felt, and, and also they gave me huge inspirations in terms of like the purpose of my study, right? Like they're not only just for my own, you know, improvement, but also for maybe like a better, like uh, China, right? And in terms of education, in terms of infrastructure and everything. So, yeah. Thank you. Um, and I'll take maybe one aspect of that for uh, um, Melanie. Why, um, in the case of Marie Ashikawa, is, um, how does that resonate with you as something that may be significant in uh, the way that similar kinds of stories would work for other students? 
Well, for me, um, I think it's important to be able to um, see yourself in historical figures and to be able to relate to them um, even like on a personal level as you're um, learning about them because um, those figures are like truly inspiring and like there's the reason why you're learning about them in class it's so that um, you can see how um, their contributions and their accomplishments have contributed to the world and how um, you might be able to make a difference as they have and Hasegawa is one such individual who um, has made such a difference in the world that um, I think it's important for um, students to um, learn about her and how they may make a difference as well. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna to try to change the emphasis a little bit here from just the, that personal aspect to still personal, but um, a couple of you and specifically, I think, you know, um, Emily and Ian in, in talking about, you know, working with uh, advocacy have ways in which maybe there's a, a very kind of personal aspect towards how do you get involved? What kinds of things um, push you to really make that commitment to get involved? So Emily, I'll, I'll ask you to kind of see if there's either an individual or how you take that next step to really get personally involved. Yes, absolutely. So I am personally affected by this, um, was influenced to do what I do right now because I had a very interesting experience when I was a senior in high school when the 2020 election was happening and our school was very, and still probably is, very how do I describe this? Basically, any politics um, is too political, as in we can't even really discuss anything politics related, even on gov uh, in my government class. Um, every topic, every lesson we had could easily turn into a political debate, and therefore every subject was too touchy to even bring up and uh, have meaningful discussions around. Um, I found my own avenue to become more politically interested and informed through my local university, actually University of Nevada, Reno. They hosted an event called uh, Nevada for Warren. And from there, I not only learned so much from their campaign in terms of what they do as a grassroots movement on a college campus, but I was also inspired to bring that to my school as well. Uh, so currently, it actually still is there, um, the Political Awareness Club, which was co-founded by me and another friend who attended that same event. We were both very inspired by uh, what we had learned, and we want to bring more political discussions to our school. So we decided to start that club, and once every week during lunch, um, it was usually juniors or seniors. Hopefully they um, invite more um, underclassmen as well, because I think the discussion um, should start as early as possible. So people um, are more informed by the time they are voting. And so ever since then, I've always been not only interested in political science and uh, politics, whether that's domestic or international, but I also want to uh, put forth my action like be able to contribute as much as I can in, um, in the movement and whatever organization I'm part of. In fact, um, aside from 1882, I'm also part of the API vote organization, um, which also is why I'm gonna do voter registration drives on campus and hopefully off campus as well this fall so that people can get registered to vote um, if they don't have the tools and the means um, in their own possession. So hopefully through my, um, my motivation, I can inspire and also encourage those around me to do the same. So yeah, that's kind of like the personal story behind the project and why I'm very motivated um, and inspired to do what I do right now. It sounds like I think that kind of inspiration is a little bit contagious in the sense that, you know, if, if you get involved and other people might get involved, you know, as well. Um, Ian, just kind of follow up on, on a little bit of what Emily's saying too. Uh, I think she was talking about some of the things that can turn into you know, very heated political discussions, all, all the rest, but there's also this aspect of making sure the teachers are comfortable with teaching, not just stuff they're unfamiliar with, but also that might lead into uh, difficult areas. You know, teaching the tough stuff, I think is what you had on there on that one slide as well. So do you have any suggestions? And also how do we approach um, you know, school divisions and other groups of interested maybe community 
uh, organizations to take this on and, and do that. Hmm. Um, well, first I wanna start with saying that um, the motivation behind the interview wasn't just uh, bringing up uh, the Chinese school teacher. Um, I mean, I went to Chinese school for um, most of uh, my school life before I graduated um, high school. And it's not like I didn't have good teachers up until that point, but that most recent one, um, he's been in the business for a while. And like I said, the enthusiasm and how knowledgeable he came across as was, um, was a big reason why I wanted to get back in touch because I didn't feel like um, I'd gathered enough, I'd really processed uh, what he was trying to convey that, um, that he thought all the students should, should partake in um, the one or two years I had taken classes with him. But um, I mean, while it may take a while, like uh, I mentioned in the video, to um, fully integrate these two cultures, match values, make sure that, um, like I said, these topics, these, um, these values are matched on both sides. Um, it's not like these things, these efforts aren't really being uh, under, undertaken. I understand that there's um, Chinese New Year festivals in um, big Asian American hotspots. Um, and these bilingual schools that may recognize that learning Chinese could be the future um, for anybody learning for, for anybody trying to pursue a career internationally. Um, so it's less, it's less uh, how to initiate it and more how to continue what we're doing already and uh, spreading the word that, um, that this is indeed the future and um, there's a lot to be learned from both sides. Thank you. Uh, I'm gonna take a question here now uh, from the chat here. This is for the whole group of interns. Uh, it's from Evelyn Moy. I'm a senior citizen with no children. So my question centers around if these topics are widely discussed among your own age group. Are there forums, Zooms that you all can get on to talk about current issues and where the quote movement of education is headed? You have a feedback loop from all generations or is it too early to tell? I'm gonna start with uh, actually asking uh, Elizabeth because uh, I want to make sure everybody gets in involved here too, maybe to take the, the first crack at that question. And then also kind of try to tie it with the question I had about uh, that's similar to the other ones that I asked, but why is it so important to really hit the younger children, elementary school age, with this kind of uh, content that we're, we've been talking about? Um, okay, I can try to take a stab at it. Um, in terms to answer the first question, um, I don't think it's too early. I feel like wisdom is really just the principal thing and everybody getting understanding on different aspects. I feel like it'll make it easier for people to, um, to understand each other better and just understanding each other's history. So I would, so I would think it's not too early. Um, everybody, it's important to have these types of discussions and to kind of tie it into what I've been doing with, um, with my lesson plans. It's important to, it's important for people to know your history. Um, in terms of my own personal life, I have growing up homeschooled, like my mom and my dad, they would teach us important things that we needed to know in life in order to operate in this world. And I, and I, and I think it's important for kids to learn about these important figures, such as like Patsy Mink or Queen Lilio Kalani and Corky Lee, like the things that these people did to advocate for the people for the people in their community is important and we should all we should talk about it and we should talk about it and advocate for things that we find important to them and that's like the main focus of my lesson plans which is just advocating for things that are important to that are important to them and just to learn how to do that and hopefully we can create a world where we don't have to do that anymore so and Vincent I'm going to ask you to kind of take this thing here too um and to keep, maybe take uh, Evelyn's question here also, and um, how is it that you talk about this with your peers and with others to try to, you know, uh, broaden our understanding of what's all happening in the uh, Asian American uh, history and what needs to be done to make it more a part of what we all learn? Yeah, I can try to, you know, take a stab at this question as well, but I think that the I guess current state of education is not so much something that is discussed in terms of 
what can officially be taught in classrooms so much as it is um uh circulated i guess among the people i've been talking with my friends as like shortcomings uh, we kind of think of it in terms of like what is lacking more so than like what um uh actually let me try to rephrase this i kind of went into that with a little uh too much so what i'm trying to uh sort of communicate here is that um there is a growing sense of awareness that um current educational structures are probably a little outdated a little too reliant on um i guess somewhat archaic forms of educating people about important topics and that um a lot of people i've been talking to are very passionate about uh reforming that system um but a lot of people don't really know how um and don't really have an avenue through which they can channel that sort of passion for empowerment um i think i'm gonna i'm just i know i brought this up a lot over the course of that video but that intro to asian american studies class was such um an amazing experience for not only me but all of the other classmates i've had um because we felt like it was for the first time, like a, a space where we could truly discuss things that we had never had the opportunity to talk about in any sort of classroom setting before. Um, and we would oftentimes like walk out of the class thinking, wow, that was like some of the best like hour and 15 minutes I've had um, all week. Um, and I guess to, to take away something from that, just giving people of our age, you know, students in college, students in high school, this space to discuss um their ideas um not even trying to like figure out how to reform education i think that is an important step um to build the connections within the community build the uh, sort of like impetus for uh reform um and uh i think that's a you know an important aspect of this whole process thank you very much um it, it kind of speaks to me to you know a, a broader question we have about education in, in general uh, and kind of two different movements. I think we've heard a lot here about how um, individuals, teachers, can bring in uh, content that's part of uh, courses they already teach, and then of course there are these initiatives uh, on uh, various state levels, like the Teach Act in Illinois, that uh, kind of mandate something that would might expose. Um, all students to certain levels of Asian American studies and such. Um, and e either way, it introduces um, things to students that they may not have seen before and to teachers as well. So maybe that's a kind of direction we should go to. Um, just got a comment on a couple of other things that have come up in the chat here. I would like to hear more about female students. Wasn't Mabel Lee, a community leader and suffragist in New York's Chinatown, one of those students um, who came here. And I think uh, this is kind of an important um, question too, to how do we bring uh, uh, the, the issue of women more directly into a customer conversation. We saw that with a number of the examples that I think people have for their lessons. Um, and uh, you know, that's, a, I think, an important part of what we're trying to do with the uh, 1882 Foundation's work. And we were gonna be sponsoring uh, China or Chinese American Women's Conference again, as we did in 2019. So I think that's really important. Um, so I think uh, you know we're beginning to run out of time here. So I want to make sure uh, that we have some time here to allow for a proper closing. But I really want to thank all of you um, for really the incredible amount of work you've done and enlightening us in lots of different ways to the uh, broader experience of Chinese Americans and Asian Americans. So congratulations to all of you and my appreciation for all your work. Um, and as I said at the beginning, I've learned a tremendous amount and I hope other people who've been part of this uh, um, talk story have also gained something. So um, Stan, I'm gonna turn it back to you uh, just for closing and some other kind and some other comments you might have. Okay, thank you, Tingy, and thank you panelists for an excellent presentation here. It was a superb presentation. I think we all learned a lot uh, and Tingy, you, you did a great job in directing this 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 discussion with meaningful questions, and and and, you, and the panelists all provided very meaningful answers. So it, it's it's like I said we are very uh, enthusiastic about our intern program that we have every summer, 
and and we are, have been blessed that you know this year we're going to have a series of, of presentations we're, we're going to have three of them by by this intern cohort you know last week we did a presentation with, with six of six of the cohort uh based on on the topic of uh uh hollywood's favorite punchline examining asian american representation in the media which if you miss that i mean i think there was a, a blurb in in the chat where i think uh uh that he referred to where you can where you can pick up a recording of that on our on our um YouTube uh, channel here on, on 1882. So if, if you missed that, and if you want to see the recording of t today's presentation, also check out that YouTube uh, link. And uh, yeah, there there it is again, way you just put it on again. So so please uh, show that to your friends and, 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 and keep this message going, this story. So it's it's been a pleasure. I mean, I don't, I don't know if anybody in the audience uh, still has any questions or not. I mean, we ask you, you put them on on the chat. But if you want to raise your hands and speak up, you know, we'll, we can certainly unmute you and and let you speak up that way also before we check out because we are running out of time here. Uh, and and I just want to say, you know, the, the the third presentation that this intern cohort will be making will be coming up uh, on, I think, uh, August the 17th, I believe, and maybe uh, Richard Wong can uh, give a little bit of a preview of what, what that's going to entail and, and more details of that. Richard, would you uh, like to speak out to that? Yes, thanks, Dan. Yeah, well, the last uh, intern talk story will be on the 17th. And it's gonna be one that really enlightened me and educated me at all levels. It started out to be a topic that I had defined as growing up Asian in today's society. What does it mean to make decisions based on your culture, right? And are, are, is your culture and cultural influences from the families or your friends and colleagues uh, dictate how you make decisions in the future as an Asian American. That was the original topic to focus on some of the taboos that uh, we grew up with in my generation, you know, such as, um, you know, marrying out of your race, uh, you know, we're, we're it's stereotyping such as, you know, we're, we're all smart in math, or like my father used to say, we work on a 27 hour day because we work so hard. So I was trying to introduce those taboo topics into today's demographics, the younger generation, and see how they felt about growing up with those you know, topics in their background. And it matured into something very different. And I don't wanna give it away you know, today, but it would be a very exciting talk story to participate in. There'll be a panel discussion, all right, led by a former uh, intern uh, with an additional intern uh, that happens to be uh, African American, so that gives you a twist of how exciting this is going to be, and uh, how dynamic it's going to be in terms of uh, the topics that will be uh, discussed next week. So I I don't want to give anything away today, but uh, stay tuned for next week. Yeah, yeah, we'll be providing details on that. So, so check you know check your mail and check our website. For details if you don't get it in the mail here but it will be on the 17th that's correct do you know what time it, uh, about it's going to be richard or i think three o'clock if, if i'm mistaken but uh we'll, we'll put out um a flyer if it's not out today it should be out uh in the next day or two well, all right i think way just just put a message on the chat saying 5 p.m all right so. okay okay so I so yeah look look for the details that's coming out there and speaking of way you know I think way's been in the background for this whole pro process here and just invaluable to us way Yan is our deputy director uh, of the 1882 foundation so I want to ask way to speak out and, and and say a few words about about just 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 say a few words way let us let us see your face and let us acknowledge the great work you had been doing for, for our foundation here. So, so Wade, come on in. I, come on, unmute yourself and say something. 
Thanks very much, Stan. Hi, everybody. I think I've met many of you um, on Zoom or in person. Thank you so much for um, spending your Sunday afternoon with us. And I just wanted to also say kudos to all of our um, associates. You guys have been so impressive from the, the last talk story to this one, and I'm sure the one that's coming up as well. So it's been such a pleasure to have you guys around. I hope you stay working with us. 1882 has lots of things going on, lots of big projects and ambitions, and um, we need all the help and support that we can get. Also, I had I saw that Evelyn had her hand up. Did you want to say something, Evelyn? Oh, thank you, Wei. Um, I just want to mention for the Chinese Americans, uh, uh, I would recommend you connect with your family association. Uh, our generation, we're all in our uh, 60s, late 60s, 70s, and we're going to need a new generation of leaders to take over, especially on the millions and millions and millions of dollars of real estate that we're all sitting on. And um, the family associations in DC, the Moy Family Association, it was purchased for 37,000 and now it's worth over $1.2 million. And after we go old, grow old and we go on and move on to the board, we certainly need a next, the next generation. And not only that, many of us have retired and we're into philanthropy. So um, many of us are sponsoring scholarships. So here's an antiquated association, organization, institution that's just ready-made and willing and ready to receive the next generation. So I really wanna encourage all of you, and even if you're not of uh, Chinese American descent, just ask around. I think there's a lot of money for education right now. Thank you. Okay, thank you. Thank you for that input. Um, and and yeah, yeah, please be aware of that. And also, you know, speaking of Chinatown, you know what that is one of our 1882 foundations uh, motivating uh, projects is to, is to, I don't know, I don't know what the right word is, but but to, to continue the growth of Chinatown in some way, to make it into a more meaningful place, destination as an ethnic touch touchstone for us, cultural touchstone for all of us who are Asian Pacific American uh, heritage. And, and we have ongoing projects in that regard. And we encourage your uh, participation with us in these. I, I don't, and I know Wei and Ted Young have been working real hard on, on expansion plans that can possibly uh, enlarge our, our footprint of, of Asian Pacific American advocacy groups in Chinatown. So get in, get in, get, make contact with us if you're interested in this at all and about how we can more, more effectively uh, sell Chinatown as, as, as the cultural touchstone which needs to be preserved, including our stories and our issues and 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 our, and, our, and, our, and just preserving our heritage there. So uh, I don't know if you want to have anything more to say about that way about the Chinatown projects, um, but but you know that that is an ongoing uh, source of you know, of of our work. So we welcome your participation in that. So I don't know if anybody else has any other. Uh, comments to make today. Uh, Ting Yi, do you have anything more to, to bring up in, in, your, ed, in edu, your education department? No, um, maybe just as a final note, um, I think there is that uh, reference to how do we continue to um, bring the professional development aspect of it to because we really do need to prepare um, teachers to be able to um, do the work that needs to be done. Um, so there's just a lot to be done, but I really appreciate everybody's efforts to uh, make it happen. Okay, okay, thanks, Tingy. Again, again, thank all our presenters, Vincent, Ian, Emily, uh, Tingy, uh, Elizabeth, Hongyan, and Melanie. Uh, so just great and good luck to you in, in your future studies and, and, and stay with us. <laughs> 
and we, we, we need you. We need your presence. You've been very valuable for us this summer. And so for everybody else, all, all our online yes, thank you very much for your participation and your support. And so uh, we'll just stop and we'll conclude the program today and then hope you all tune in to on the 17th to our presentation at that time. So have a good day, everybody. Bye.